Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone joining from across the country and around the world, and happy International Women's Day. I am Cynthia Ritchie Terrell, founder and director of Represent Women. A very well, warm welcome to our inaugural Democracy Solutions Summit, which brings together experts and leaders in election administration, voting rights, and democracy reform, who are working on solutions to build a 21st century democracy. Thank you all so much for being here today. The first day of the summit is centered on fair elections, upgrading how we vote and finance campaigns. We'll hear about viable, scalable, and transformative solutions such as early voting, vote by mail, universal voter registration, and innovations in campaign finance. The day will end with actionable takeaways so that you'll know exactly how to help advance these solutions. This event will be recorded and posted on our website after the event, and closed captions are available in your Zoom menu. To start us off today, Danielle Allen, political theorist at Harvard University, and New Mexico Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver will speak to the challenges we're facing as a nation in relation to fair elections. Take it away, Danielle. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Happy International Women's Day. It is great to be here with you and everybody else from Represent Women. Your leadership is extraordinary and we're so grateful to you for everything you do to make space for women's voices and women's power throughout our political system. Thank I'm you. Danielle Allen, in addition to my role as a subject matter expert, so to speak. Um, I've recently completed a campaign uh, running for Democratic nomination for governor in Massachusetts. And I want to say a little bit about that experience to really draw attention to the pressing problems we have for our democracy and for achieving access and voice for all. Our democracy is broken. I've felt that way for a while. I had the pleasure of co-chairing a commission from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that put out a report in June 2020 called Our Common Purpose that offered a lot of solutions for improving our democracy. But the brokenness of our democracy comes through in some really basic existential ways. Young people who feel with pressing force the anxiety of climate look at our democracy and say, you're not responding to the existential threat of our times. You know, how, what good are you? And we see record numbers of young people disaffected from our democracy. We see communities of color where questions of justice reform stall and stagnate and don't move forward. And same thing, you look at the institutions of our government and you think, what, you know, if you're not delivering, what good are you? And there's a strong sense of alienation and, and disaffection. But then you look at what we see in our political institutions and you see an absence of voice. People of color underrepresented throughout our political institutions, young people's voices not always being taken seriously, women underrepresented in our state legislature in Massachusetts. We have only some sort of 28% or so of our legislators are women, despite obviously our majority place in the population. So tackling our core problems is really about changing how voice enters into political decision making. And at the end of the day, there are two fundamentals for how voice enters into influence. There's the question of voting to express our voice and there's a the question of running for office. And I found in my own experience of running for governor in Massachusetts that the barriers to both, even in Massachusetts, are still huge. So across Massachusetts, young people do not vote at the same levels as in other states. Communities of color have lower rates of turnout in Massachusetts than in other states. And when I met with people, I would sit down and talk with people, they would express a desire for more responsive governance, but also then a sense of not having access to participation. And it was clear that some very basic solutions like same day registration, I mean, you can vote, you can register day of, would make a difference. When young people move, they sometimes get caught, not able to register in time for the election and they can't participate. Early voting, mail-in voting, I met lots of people who are juggling multiple jobs and really just fitting in the time to participate is a massive challenge. So if we're gonna get voice in through voting, we really do have to find solutions to the barriers to voting. The second way we get voice into our politics for influence is through running for office. You've gotta vote your interest and you've gotta run your interest. You've gotta do both of those things. In Massachusetts, it turns out that we have some of the most complex procedures for getting your name on the ballot. 
And in fact, among all 50 states, we're the only state that makes people compete with each other to get their names on the ballot for statewide office. And that pro process, those procedures for ballot access prohibit people from even putting their hats in the ring in the first place. And if you can't run your interest, then you don't get your voice um, in the mix to achieve influence. So we are facing pressing existential crises of all kinds. COVID made that so much more intense. The only way we can address that is if we have a democracy that actually achieves fairness. It gets votes and voices into the mix so that decision making can be responsive to felt needs on the ground. So when we look to the barriers to universal participation, we should see, yes, barriers to empowerment, barriers to the chances people have for their own personal well-being, but also barriers blocking our ability to solve the hardest problems that we have as a society. So it's just so important for us to achieve equal access to the vote, equal access to running for office so that together we can actually deliver for our, our felt needs, our lived pain points and address our existential challenges. We need democracy because it gives us the best chance for human empowerment and human flourishing. But that democracy, it matters, it's so valuable because it's also the way together we can solve our hardest problems. So I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this conversation, to have the chance to kick off by just saying yes, this year on the trail brought home to me, it's real. The challenges to access to the vote are real, even in Massachusetts. The challenge to getting your name on the ballot are real, even in Massachusetts. So we need your help with the solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you. it over now to Secretary Toulouse from New Mexico. Sorry. Thank Cynthia. you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the technology is working. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Maggie Talese Oliver, New Mexico Secretary of State. And I just wanna thank Cynthia and the Represent Women team for inviting me to be here uh, to kick off this incredibly important event. Um, you know, it, it's such an interesting, I think Danielle really highlighted what an interesting time uh, and, and frankly, a, a somewhat scary time we're in in our democracy. Uh, you know, as women, we all know uh, how hard the, uh, the right to vote was fought for uh, for decades. And we've had it for barely a hundred years now. And we're still, you know, not achieving parity in uh, government institutions throughout the country. We're getting closer and closer with every election. Um, but with some of the new challenges uh, that have particularly arisen uh, to our small democracy over uh, the last couple of years, uh, you know, we continue to try to figure out how we are going to make our democracy work for everyone. Um, you know, as Danielle mentioned, there are still challenges to accessing the ballot. Um, you know, she's she talked a little bit about what she saw in her own personal experience in Massachusetts and very different state of New Mexico, a very, very large sized state uh, with far fewer people, but very spread out and very very diverse. Um, and over my time as an election administrator for the last 15 years, uh, I was a, a local election administrator before I became Secretary of State about five years ago. You know, we've seen these challenges evolve. Um, what is really um, concerning to me that as we embark on this 2022 election year, as we look around the country, our the, the efforts that states are making to roll back access to the ballot box in the name of quote unquote election integrity. Um, the reality is that uh, you cannot have uh, election integrity without full access to the ballot box. These things are not mutually exclusive. Uh, and, and like I, you know, like I like to say, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can make sure our elections are secure while also guaranteeing that access. So as we look across the country and we see these challenges um, that are supposedly in response to election integrity, like limiting the ability to vote by mail, 
limiting early voting, um, the, the rigmarole over having secured uh, drop boxes for folks to drop their ballots off. I mean, these are all really important ways to access the ballot. And particularly, you know, I'm, I'm a single working mom, you know, and I think about um, the challenges that I have, you know, just trying to manage uh, my life and my child's life and my work life. Um, and I need all the options possible to make sure that I can cast a ballot and I run a elections for a living. Um, so, I, you know, I always think when we look at these um, policies that are taking place across the country that are supposedly in response to integrity of elections, what we're, you know, actually seeing is that that limiting of access that really negatively impacts the integrity of our elections. Um, you know, the other challenge that we're dealing with right now and the election sphere is is really we are at, at peak mis and disinformation about how our elections are run. You know, every state across the country has so many mechanisms in place to ensure that our elections are run fairly and transparently. Most folks don't even know, uh, you know, the half of what our election administrators do. And we have Democratic, Republican, and Independent, and other party election administrators around the country um, that take these roles very seriously and the fairness of our elections very seriously. Um, so it's really important as, as we're looking across the issues and the challenges uh, to ballot access and to voting uh, in 2022 that we look at, well, what are what is going right? Uh, and how can we continue to make sure the American public knows about all of these things uh, and do better, do a better job with voter information and really uh, pushing back against the mis and disinformation that is out there right now about how our elections are run. Um, you know, here, here in my state, we're, we're trying to do a lot of things, uh, you know, just like every state across the nation, we're trying to, you know, make sure our rural and tribal communities have access to drop boxes for their ballots. We're trying to make sure that folks have voter information at the tip of their fingers. But this is a huge challenge, not just for me and my staff and the 33 county clerks that I work with around the state to administer elections. It's the same for every election administration office across the country. So as you're talking about, you know, how do we overcome these challenges and what are those solutions? Uh, I would really encourage you all, let's think about ways that we can all do a collective better job as citizens of this country to make sure that we are all well informed and educated about how our elections work. Uh, what are those integrity processes that are already in place and how we can better uh, communicate with our friends and relatives and neighbors about actually how great a job we do uh, across the country in terms of ensuring the accuracy of our elections. Um, so with that, that's the final thought I'll leave Leave you with. I could say so much more, but you have a lot to cover uh, in the next few days. Um, just thank you again so much for being here, for coming together to collectively think of these uh, fantastic uh, solutions that I know are going to come out of the summit. And thank you again for asking me to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Danielle and Secretary Toulouse Oliver, for about your valuable insights and perspectives. Uh, now that we have an understanding of the challenges that we're facing, We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, the Honorable Amber McReynolds and Acting Secretary Lee Chapman will talk about early voting, vote by mail, and universal voter registration as a few solutions to these challenges. We'll see you back here in two minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone, and a warm welcome to voting experts uh, Amber McReynolds and Acting Secretary of State Lee Chapman. Amber McReynolds is a national election expert, former election official, and a USPS governor. Lee Chapman is the Acting Secretary of State of Pennsylvania and previously served as Executive Director of Deliver My Vote. I pass the mic over to you, Amber. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia. And I'm not able to start my video, but hopefully um, somebody will <laughs> make that happen. Um, oh, great, there it goes. I just had to say it. <laughs> um, well, great to be here, Cynthia. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. And it's an honor to uh, share this session with Secretary Lee Chapman from Pennsylvania, who's been a dear friend for many years and really one of the, the champions for voters and for democracy. Uh, not only nationally in her work prior to being a Secretary of State in Pennsylvania, but certainly for the people of Pennsylvania. Uh, so welcome, Secretary Chapman, and it's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Amber. Thanks for having me. Good Absolutely. to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Um, well, this is, uh, it, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a true honor to be a part of this Solution Summit, and I love that Represent Women has named it uh, as such that we're focused on solutions, focused on the future, and focused on improving the voting experience and strengthening our democracy for all. Uh, and there is a, a, a large amount of uh, communications and activity that, that's happening nationwide, some good and, and some not so good. And that is really the, the challenge that we have before us is to uh, figure out solutions to the problems that we know exist in terms of uh, creating a fair process for everyone, uh, but also try to celebrate when good things happen. And there, there have been some examples of, of good and positive policy changes for voters happening nationally. Uh, Secretary Chapman, I want to, as we kick off here, we'd love to get, have you give a perspective of how you see the current environment in Pennsylvania, what you're doing uh, coming on now as Secretary of State, uh, and really what you see these uh, big challenges before you uh, in your new role as Secretary of State in Pennsylvania. Well, um, thanks again, Amber, and thank you to Represent Women for having this um, forum on International Women's Day. I'm so happy to be here. And Actually, it's my um, two month anniversary of being acting Secretary of State at the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So I'm somewhat newer to this role, um, but I'm not new to um, Pennsylvania or the Department of State. I actually was policy director here for two years um, between 2015 and 2017 at the beginning of the Wolf administration. Um, and I returned to Pennsylvania after many years in Washington, DC, I'm working for nonprofit, nonpartisan organizations. And that's where Amber and my path, paths crossed um, in some of those former positions. So really happy to be here in Pennsylvania. And you know, in recent years, since I was gone, um, Pennsylvania really has expanded voting rights for, um, for um, the over 9 million Pennsylvanians that are registered to vote here. Um, you know, we passed um, historic bipartisan legislation um, in 2019 that brought um, vote by mail in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So before um, Act 77, that was the reform, um, you had to have an excuse to request a vote by mail ballot. So, you know, voters have really enjoyed using it. We've seen over 4 million voters participate via mail um, in 2020. And you know they've used it in 2021, and we're definitely going to see that continue. Um, but as far as your question, with some of the biggest challenges we're facing right now in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I would say one of the biggest challenges is you know we um, are faced with a lot of litigation right now. Um, there were over 30 lawsuits in 2020. Many of those lawsuits are still continuing, and you know we're in the middle of redistricting and finalizing our, our maps. Um, so there's a lot in flux with that. We have um, our congressional um, maps um, currently in place and we're, we're, pin we're waiting for our legislative maps. So, um, you know, there's some uncertainty around what the dates are for petition filing and with candidates and what have you. So that's one challenge. I would say, um, you know, another challenge that we're facing is just resources. Um, 
in Pennsylvania, we are one of, we're the fifth largest state, but we have one of the smallest election staffs in the country, actually. Um, the only states that are, have smaller staff than us are Idaho and South Dakota um, and Rhode Island. So for the 9 million voters we serve, that's definitely a challenge. You know, um, our election workers um, at the Department of State are working very hard to support our 67 counties in the Commonwealth. And that's a challenge of having such a small staff. Um, you know, so I, you know, I don't want to take up too much time because I'm sure you have many questions, but there's really challenges on all fronts and what we're doing um, in, under my leadership is really to make sure that we have expanded opportunities to vote um, and that we're engaging the 3.2 million eligible voters in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania who did not vote in 2020. So we are really using creative techniques to, um, to meet voters where they are and make sure that they have the information um, in order to register to vote and cast their ballot. Great, thank you so much. And I wanna, I wanna just pick up on one of the, the, the actually the last comment you just made because um, what, you know, we look at 2020, it was a historic turnout election where we had uh, one of the highest turnouts we've had on record in the United States. And yet nationally, it was only 66%, which is about two thirds of the voters. And so we have one in three voters did not vote. Almost 80 million people did not participate in the most historic, largest turnout of our, of our time. And so that to me, you know, obviously uh, demonstrates that we have, we have work to do because mm -hmm. Uh, whether it was a lack of education or a barrier to the voting process, which we know also still occurs, we have work to do to continue to encourage uh, voters to participate. Um, and, you know, one of the topics that we wanted to talk about, and you and I have talked about extensively over the years, is, is the expanded options to meet people where they are, as you just said, uh, whether that be early voting in person or voting uh, at home and those options. So give us a sense of, you know, obviously you, you passed Acts at 77 in a bipartisan way a few years ago, but uh, maybe give us a little bit more um, info about how you're looking at those issues, what the risks are or what the threats are against mm -hmm. some of those reforms that have that have occurred in Pennsylvania and how you see the future of, of voting in, in Pennsylvania. Right, so as far as Act 77 goes, which is our vote by mail um, expansion, that's currently being litigated in the courts right now. So for, from my perspective, you know, I can't really go into detail about active litigation, but from, from my perspective, it's important that we're communicating with voters about how they can request a mail ballot, because even though there's litigation, the current law in the state of Pennsylvania is that voters can request a ballot. So we are you know, reaching voters via text message, via email, um, just to make sure that they know, even though they're hearing things in the media and the news about um, the litigation, it's still um, in place for the primary unless otherwise. So we're communicating with counties and communicating directly with voters because the last thing we want is any voter confusion. Um, but, you know, in, in Pennsylvania, the, the election code had really not been updated in over 70 years up until 2019. So, you know, a lot of other states, you know, I've worked on the national level, um, you know, the way you vote really depends on where you live and what your zip code is, as Amber knows. And there's thousands of election jurisdictions, elections are run thousands of different ways. Um, but Pennsylvania does have a long way to go in terms of expanding um, elections in terms of what other states have adopted. So as far as our legislative agenda, you know, we are advocating for same day voter registration, um, also for early in person voting. That's something we don't have robustly in Pennsylvania like other states do. Um, making sure that we are also working with the counties. Well, one of the things the counties have actually um, said that they want is pre-canvassing. So, you know, as we all know, we were watching the election results in 2020 and states like Florida were able to report their results the night of the election where Pennsylvania took a while. Um, so having that ability for counties to be able to pre-canvas and process some of those ballots well in advance of election day will definitely reduce the strain on, on counties. So that's another piece we're advocating for. So a lot of these are like really simple common sense reforms that are in other jurisdictions um, and we want to bring to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. 
Right, and thank you for highlighting a couple of those, especially the, the technical issue of being able to pre-process. Pennsylvania is one of a few states that still don't allow for that to occur, and it's it's not a partisan issue. It just simply helps election officials do their jobs. It provides more transparency in the election process than, than what you would see otherwise. And, and you mentioned Florida, they've been pre-processing and doing that for years, and they had they had very fairly swift results because they were able to do that. Um, and frankly, all of the issues you said, uh, same day registration, early voting in person, vote by mail, these again are all nonpartisan uh, reforms that benefit all electors. Uh, they, they benefit the entirety, they meet people where they are, um, and yet so many of them have been politicized on, uh, inappropriately and unfairly um, when really they are simply to benefit this electorate at, at large uh, and not one party or another. Um, one other uh, question I have for you, um, and, and it's International Women's Day, it's wonderful to be a part of Represent Women's uh, Conference here, but uh, one of the reports that Reed College actually, they did a survey of election officials um, nationally as part of a report, and most people don't realize this, but about 80% of election officials are, are in fact women. Uh, and so women are serving on the front lines, uh, serving voters across the country, and yet we've also seen this significant targeting of election officials, either through disinformation or physical threats of violence or other harassment that we've seen in so many states around the country. So I'd love you just to talk about that, because I think the statistics of this being an industry largely dominated by women on the front lines and then also coupled with these uh, continuous attacks against election officials, would just love to hear your thoughts on how we address that, what you're doing in Pennsylvania, uh, and, and what the community at large, especially so many of uh, those that care deeply that are on the call today, uh, listening to, to this session. Thank you for that. And that's a wonderful stat. I had no idea that 80% of election officials are women. So thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate that um, we are seeing threats um, you know, to frontline election workers, election workers, especially county election directors and commissioners in Pennsylvania, you know, really um, are at the front lines of our democracy. And um, it's really discouraging that we're seeing this um, change in how um, they are, they should be, you know, revered as opposed to um, threatened for just doing their jobs. So, you know, we have very close relationships with county election workers. We um, communicate with them by weekly on phone calls and we take threats very seriously. Um, you know, we have partners at the state and federal level. Um, so we make sure that we're reporting any threats immediately to law enforcement um, because it's unacceptable. And, um, you know, we need to make sure that this isn't happening anymore. But, you know, I think that's really, um, the grim side of things, but I would encourage women, you know, to run for office and to um, seek out these these positions. Um, you know, you can really have a huge impact on your state or your um, county or you know local races if you're in these positions. And um, you know, I'm hoping that there's going to be change as, as we have to just call out things as they're happening to to in order for us to have change and. Um, in our country. And I, I would just say when it comes to Pennsylvania in particular, um, one fact that a lot of people don't know about is Pennsylvania actually had the first African American woman secretary of state. Um, her name was C. Dolores Tucker, and um, she was the first African American woman secretary of state in the entire nation in the 1970s. So it's an honor to really follow in her footsteps. Um, as acting Secretary of State currently in Pennsylvania. So great, thank you for sharing that. Um, another uh, question I have for you, um, and, and you, you mentioned a little bit about running for office or getting involved in being election officials, but what are the, some of the other ways um, that, that you feel that the public, whether that be voters or people that have time to serve as election judges or as poll workers, or just the public at large, like how do you, what are some uh, examples of the way that the public can help and support election officials and democracy? Maybe some that have a lot of time, some that don't have a lot of time, but would just be curious about 
what you need as a chief election official in a state, how you think the public could engage and what you would encourage so many that are on the call that deeply care about this to, uh, to, to, to get engaged, to, to help support you. Sure, thank you for that. And I think you mentioned this in the last question. Um, you know, in recent years, misinformation and disinformation has really been an issue when it comes to um, elections. And I would say the first thing you can do is just make sure that you are sharing reliable and accurate information with your friends, your family, you know, on social media, and lift up some of the official government um, sources. You know, we as secretaries of state, we're participating in a national association of secretaries of state campaign called Trusted Info. So, um, you know, if you can retweet or repost anything around election dates and deadlines, um, if you hear about misinformation, it's always important not to amplify that misinformation, but make sure that you are, um, you know, inoculating it by sharing correct information. So that's the number one thing that I would, um, um, you know, ask you to do. I would also say just get involved in your community. Um, you know, there's so many different organizations that are local or um, at the state level that you can get involved in that you can help reg register voters or you can sign up to be a poll worker. Um, as we all know that there's a lot of poll worker shortages and, you know, we're entering our third year of the pandemic and the pandemic really exacerbated the poll worker shortages. And it was an issue even before the pandemic um, and a lot of poll workers are aging now. So that's a really great way that you can participate and get involved. Um, and in Pennsylvania, a lot of people don't realize this, um, election judges are elected. So that's also a great entry level into elected office if you want to run for um, that position as well. So, um, you know, you can get involved with um, some of the programs that engage young people as well. In Pennsylvania, we have um, the Governor's Civic Engagement Award, which encourages high school students to register their peers. And it was when I was here before, I was actually part of the team that implemented that. Um, so it's great to see how many hundreds, if not thousands of young people have registered to vote. Um, and you know, studies show the earlier you are registered and engaged in the political process, the more you're likely to participate. And just a quick follow up on that. In, uh, in not every state is exactly the same, but can how old do you have to be to be a poll worker or serve as an election judge in Pennsylvania? Is it 16? Uh, yeah, in Pennsylvania, we actually have a unique rule where you can be a student and serve as a poll worker, where a lot of states don't have that. So yeah, at 16 years old, you can serve as a poll worker. I have to check on the election judge. I don't know the exact one. I think that might be 18, um, but I'll check on that. Yeah, and just for the audience to, you know, every state varies on this, but that's one of the um, suggestions I, I make this a lot. If if you're planning to be an election judge and you either have uh, a niece, a nephew, a, a grandchild, a, a son or a daughter that, that you know, could serve with you, there's, I've, I've heard of parents trying to uh, serve with their, with their, no, uh, with their children. And it's, it's kind of a unique way to get students involved uh, early and do something together that's that's fun and out, outside of the norm and support democracy. So yes. um, it's a great uh, way to do that. Um, okay, I, we've got a couple of minutes left and uh, you know, I think the next, what I'd like to do, Lee, is really, you know, if you had a magic wand and, and could, uh, could, could uh, address all the challenges that you have before you in Pennsylvania or, uh, you know, really looking at the future, what are the big the big ideas? What do you see coming next? Uh, what do you think the future holds for uh, voting and democracy in Pennsylvania and also uh, nationally? Oh, that's a great question. Well, <laughs> if I had a magic wand, I would you know implement all of those reforms that I mentioned before. So the same day registration, the pre canvassing, the early in person voting, you know, just making sure that voters have every single option to cast their ballot. And there's best practices around the country. Um, that have been used for a long time. So just making sure that we're moving closer to the gold standard when it comes to election administration. And, you know, unfortunately I'm in the executive branch, so I can't, well, not unfortunately, fortunately I'm in the executive branch, so I can't pass laws, but, um, you know, we are having those conversations with the legislature um, so we can implement that. But, you know, I'm, well, during my time here, I'm really going to do everything in my power 
that I can do administratively to make sure that we're improving access. A lot of that comes, um, one thing that comes to mind is um, National Voter Registration Act compliance. Um, a, a few people don't remember this, but you know, yesterday was um, the 57th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. And a year ago, um, President Biden actually issued an executive order um, to reaffirm the commitment to expand voter registration. And one thing that he did that was very interesting in that executive order is he basically said that states can designate federal agencies that are operating in the state to be national voter registration um, offices. So for example, um, some states like California have designated um, USCIS as a voter registration um, agency. So at every naturalization ceremony, there's someone from USCIS that has registration forms. So there's a lot that we can do um, in, you know, as Secretary of State in my administration, administrative power to expand access to voter registration. Because in Pennsylvania, there's over 1.7 million people who are eligible to vote, but they're not registered. And as we all know, if you're not registered, you can't participate. So just making sure that I'm implementing um, initiatives that can really chip away at that 1.7 million number. That's a great, you brought up the 1.7 million that are eligible, not registered. I mean, this is another example of a policy reform. I'll just quickly highlight for everyone here. Uh, automatic voter registration is, is really the modern day version of what was required in the National Voter Registration Act that uh, created Motor Voter, set up op more opportunities for people to register to vote. And automatic voter registration is largely just effective and modern implementation of MVRA, meaning that we're uh, offering and creating more automation around uh, capturing data. And simply so that people don't have to keep filling out the same government form and having all of that extra bureaucracy. Uh, I always encourage people to even just in a given month or a given year, count how many times you have to fill out your name and your address and your date of birth and these same pieces of information all the time for so many different interactions that you have with government. And you'll see where the benefit of automatic voter registration uh, could come into play where we're just, it's not advantaging one side or the other. It's simply just making government work more effectively and saving money. It's, it saves states so much money uh, when, when more of that is automated, uh, which is good for election officials, it's good for taxpayers, and it's uh, good for everyone. So I'm glad you highlighted that. Um, and uh, as we close out, I think I think I, there's like one minute left, and Cynthia, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm trying to <laughs> trying to manage the clock on our session. Um, would just love, uh, you know, for you to share um, any uh, inspirational thoughts or quotes or, or anything that has encouraged you over time. You're clearly the Secretary of State of the fifth largest state in the country and uh, would just love to hear uh, what your advice is uh, for the folks on the call and, and the future generations. Um, while you're thinking about it, I'll, I'll just, I'm, I just wanna give everyone uh, one of my favorite quotes. Um, uh, Amelia Earhart actually said, the most difficult thing is the decision to act the rest is merely tenacity. And I love this quote, and I think it's so uh, uh, it, uh, representative of everything that you said, Secretary Chapman, but what so many secretaries of state and so many frontline local election officials are experiencing uh, where they are acting and they are in service to the public on a daily basis. And uh, I feel like we can all do uh, more of that uh, in our everyday lives, but certainly in service to our democracy. So with that, I'll give you the the last uh, thing there, and feel free to share whatever uh, has inspired you over time. Sure, so I will share the picture that's behind me, which is um, Sweet Liberty, and it's by Kadir Nelson as the artist, and he's a famous African-American artist. He's done a lot of different portraits, some that are in the portrait gallery in Washington, DC. But this is a picture that he painted um, after the 2020 election, and it's a, of a little girl She's African-American and she, I don't know if you can see, but she has a blue iris in her hair, which symbolizes hope. Um, her sleeves are rolled up um, and she's holding an American flag. And this, the symbolism of her sleeves rolling up is that, you know, it takes a lot of hard work for us to get to an inclusive democracy, but, you know, we are going to get there um, if we all work together. So I look at her and she's my inspiration 
every day. And that's why I have the painting um, hanging behind me. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, okay, I, I I ended, I think, right at the right point, Cynthia. So yay, yay me for managing the clock. Um, thank you, Secretary Chapman, for being a, a part of this summit. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. And, and thank you for all of your work that you're doing for voters, not only in Pennsylvania, but nationally. We're, we're all grateful uh, to you for that. So thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Amber. And thank you, Cynthia. Thank you so much both for those beautiful quotes um, and for sharing your wisdom and your expertise with us on how we can improve elections through improved election administration. Really appreciate it. Really, thanks so much for all your terrific work and um, look forward to taking on tackling all those great solutions that you're proposing. So thank you very much. We'll again now take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Sheila Krumholtz, Chi Sun Lee and Ann Ravel for a discussion on innovations in campaign finance reform. We'll see you back here in two minutes. Welcome back everyone, and welcome to campaign finance experts, Sheila Krumholtz, Executive Director of Open Secrets, Chi Sun Lee, Director of Elections and Government at the Brennan Center, and Ann Ravel, former Federal Elections Commission Chair and Fair Political Practices Commission Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I think, uh, hi, Chisun and Anne and everyone. I believe I am kicking off our panel. Um, so I will uh, start by thanking Cynthia and, um, and Represent Women for hosting the conversation. And because I know there are a lot of uh, women and men out there doing critical work, happy International Women's Day. And thank you for all you do to support a healthy and representative democracy. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Open Secrets and dive into some figures, kind of lay the table, set the table for where we're at and hand the mic over. Uh, so I lead Open Secrets, uh, founded last year by the merger of the Center for Responsive Politics and the National Institute on Money and Politics, two nonpartisan nonprofits now joined to follow the money in US politics and policy. And we track campaign finance, dark money, lobbying, including foreign lobbying, spending on political advertising, basically money wherever, political money wherever it flows. We'll make this data searchable, uh, report on the money angle to help people make sense of it. And you can sign up for our weekly newsletter to get the latest on money and politics by going to opensecrets.org. We are not a reform organization, uh, but we produce data and analysis in hopes that the public will be informed and that reform proposals will be evidence-based. But we do advocate for one thing, and that is transparency, because without access to information, like who's paying for our elections, we couldn't do our job, the press can't do theirs, and the public can't effectively evaluate candidates 
and represent their own interests without being able to ask who's funding this candidate or committee and what does and does that money have strings attached. So uh, transparency is not enough, but it's an essential pillar of democracy. Uh, and because so much money comes now and so much com money comes from secret sources that are sometimes fueling cynical mis or disinformation campaigns, uh, this is essential uh, information for us to deliver. A voter's job has gotten a lot more difficult and our transparency objective has become a lot more complex, but also more important. So I'll give you a quick data overview um, of where things stand in campaign finance. First, the money is off the charts now, $14.4 billion spent in 2020, more than double the 2016 presidential cycle. We were flabbergasted. Uh, it was way beyond what we had predicted. Of that amount, thanks to Citizens United, Super PACs and other outside groups spent $2.9 billion. 325 of these super PACs were single candidate super PACs, which act more like extensions of the campaign, allowing donors to max out to the candidate and then go on to spend unlimited sums on their behalf. Outside spenders in about three dozen campaigns spent more than all of the candidates combined. So candidates aren't just raising money to compete against their opponents, they're raising money to defend themselves from outside groups that have no limits and can crop up at any moment. Essentially, candidates can never raise enough money. In terms of real threats we're seeing in campaign finance, dark money is at or near the top. In Citizens United, the Supreme Court affirmed the need for disclosure of political donations by a margin of eight to one. But between a hyperpartisan Congress, a feckless FEC, and a hamstrung IRS, nonprofits violate the tax exempt rules by pretending to have a social welfare or other purpose while being highly politically active and using the lax rules to raise money from secret sources. And these sources may in fact be foreign donors, foreign corporations, even foreign governments, even our adversaries. So this is a problem of national security as well as one of protecting the basic integrity of our electoral system and ultimately our democracy. All told, we tracked more than a billion dollars in dark money spending last cycle, of which only 88 million was reported to the FEC. So if you're relying on what's reported, you're missing the story. This year, it's hard to say what will be spent, except that it's almost certain to be higher and probably much higher than the 5.9 billion spent in 2018, the last midterm cycle. And that's just at the federal level. State level races are significant this year with about 7,000 seats on the ballot across the country, including 36 governors, 31 attorneys general, 26 secretaries of state, and nearly 1,800 legislative seats. So we have our work cut out for us. So what does all this money to all these races mean? It means that candidates have to raise thousands of dollars every day. Last cycle to win, candidates, House candidates needed to spend about $2.4 million, and in the Senate, more than $27 million, way, way up from any prior cycle. And our data shows that the candidate with more money wins 88% of the time in the House and 71% of the time in the Senate. So candidates need more than great ideas, charisma, hustle, and a good campaign organization. They need access to money because while having money doesn't guarantee success, not having it can torpedo a great candidate's campaign. Um, I am going to... Um, to, uh, reserve my other comments and uh, turn the mic over to, I believe, Anne or Anne Ravel is going next. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Sheila, for that uh, great preface to my uh, presentation. And I also, of course, want to thank Cynthia for putting this on. And I'm looking at the um, information, there's already 144 participants in this uh, event, which is amazing and really important. So thank you so much for doing it. Um, as, as Sheila said, and the data provided by Open Secrets clearly shows, we have a campaign finance system that's dominated by big donors. Of course, there's super PACs and other groups, but uh, definitely big donors and not lots of small donors um, as has been touted many times. Um, it is really not as effective 
uh, when there's millions of dollars being spent in campaigns. Um, and what has happened, as, as I think Sheila mentioned, uh, it's created an impediment uh, for diverse candidates and women to run for office because they have much less access uh, to the wealth that's required in order to run because of the great expense. The impact of the barriers is that the policies that are enacted by our elected officials tend to help their donors. And I know uh, Sheila didn't speak about this, but they've done reports, um, Open Secrets has, uh, or uh, the predecessor, about the uh, influence of donors um, that uh, on public policy. And definitely we know from other studies that the elected officials tend to help their donors and not have and not enact laws that will help the community, which results in fewer laws that address the needs and interests of women, families, and people of color, and actually of most of the people in the United States and in different states. Um, and as the former chair and commissioner of the FEC, I saw these problems with the impact of money and politics firsthand. And importantly, um, and I, I uh, like the term feckless FEC, but it's probably not strong enough. So uh, Sheila, you need to come up with a, with a worse <laughs> term. Um, it, the, the FEC, uh, you can see there the impacts of money um, and yet they were enacted to assure the transparency that's really important uh, for people to be able to vote um, and fair and balanced elections. And that was right after Watergate that the FEC was enacted to do that. And yet they have failed to fulfill their mission in a little over the last 10 years, maybe more, uh, to guarantee a fair and representative democracy. Um, and I saw that extreme dysfunction at the FEC um, myself uh, firsthand. Uh, the enforcement role, role is really important to protect the integrity of our campaign finance system uh, because for one thing, it does provide a lot of disclosure at times. But um, if, you, if there is no enforcement, uh, there is no deterrence for campaign finance violations. And we know that uh, there's many foreign donors um, in campaigns, which is illegal, and yet uh, there has not been any significant activity on the part of the FEC to deal with those problems. And the FEC also does not, when they do uh, break their deadlock, that I'll talk about in a minute, um, they ne nevertheless do not impose meaningful fines on most of the violators that they um, that they have have brought enforcement the few enforcement actions um, against uh, and so there's all kinds of openings for illegal sources of money not just um, not just foreign money but other illegal sources of money. Uh, covertly flowing into the elections and as well as the dark money that was mentioned. Um, so recently uh, there was an analysis and not to be partisan here, but of um, a number of cases, there were about 50 of them that were filed against the Trump campaign uh, and the Trump committee and more than 25 of those cases at the FEC were determined by their totally nonpartisan general counsel to have been clear violations of the law. And yet the commission on those, case, those 25 cases uh, split 3-3, which is normal uh, because the Republicans voted not to uh, not to enforce 
and the Democrats voted to enforce, and it requires four votes in order to um, actually take an action to enforce a case. And therefore, those, uh, none of those cases were ever investigated or enforced um, for, the, for what were held to be clear violations. And the, what's, what's a real concern about this, obviously, is that the, uh, the Republicans who voted not to enforce claimed that it was um, because of prosecutorial uh, discretion and that it would uh, be too expensive for the commission to enforce the law. But that's the job, that's the mission. And unfortunately, when people see these things, number one, it's true that uh, a lot of the candidates realize that they could violate the law with impunity, but also uh, it really does impact the public trust in the democratic process because a lot of people are concerned about the extent of money in, in politics. And just as a mention, it was interesting to listen to Danielle Allen. I too ran for office. I ran for state Senate in California. And I saw firsthand uh, the uh, $5 million of independent expenditures that were spent against me with uh, negative ads where you could hardly tell exactly who it was that was funding it. Uh, and so this is not only a federal problem, but it can be an issue throughout the states as well. Um, so I'm, uh, and, and I have to say that part of the problem in my, in my situation had to do with what the RAND Corporation uh, calls um, truth decay, which is uh, these, a lot of these more anonymous groups that spend enormous amounts of money uh, do not have to abide by truth. Uh, they generally are the dark money groups are the ones because they are not the candidates themselves are very, it's easy for them to make up things and to, to engage in vitriol uh, because there's no accountability. So I'm looking forward to hearing Chisholm and what she is proposing as a solution to some of these issues. Thank you, Anne. And if it's okay, Sheila, I'll just jump right in. I, um, thank you, Cynthia, and Represent Women for organizing this really critical conversation just when we need it. Um, I agree with everything that my uh, co-panelists have stated as problems and special gratitude to Open Secrets because we have worked with you, National Institute on Money and Politics, Campaign Finance Institute to attempt to make our policy recommendations evidence-based. Um, we couldn't do it without you, it's such critical work. Um, so I am the director, I'm Chi Sun Lee, I'm director of elections and government at the Brennan Center. And to dive right into the question I think Anne was tossing to me, which is, what can be done given the Supreme Court that we have where its interpretation of the constitution really hamstrings what we can do to limit this outsized spending and a Congress that is gridlocked on things that can be done like greater transparency and stopping super PACs from coordinating with candidates. The most exciting reform that we have been working on at the Brennan Center, uh, alongside so many across the country, is what we call small donor public financing. It's also known as citizen funded elections. Um, it comes in different, uh, different variations. The most common form is multiple match small donor public financing. There are also um, what some call clean election sort of lump sum grants once a candidate hits a certain threshold of being able to raise enough money from enough uh, constituents, they can get a grant to run. And then there is Seattle's voucher program where people, uh, where voters and uh, residents are given a certain amount of money to donate to campaigns who choose to participate 
um, and whom they want to support. And um, I guess to really focus on the theme of today, you know, what, there are a number of benefits to this policy that we've been researching and um, gathering over time. Overall, they increase the numbers of people who participate in the campaign finance side of elections as small donors. And small donor public financing programs increase the diversity of who participates as a donor in terms of um, their demographics. Where do they live in non-wealthy zip codes? Um, you know, some of the, what I'm sure is not news to anyone here is that white men dominate uh, campaigns for office and also dominate giving, even if those trends have shifted a little bit um, over recent cycles. Uh, women, people of color, and in particular women of color are significantly underrepresented in elected office and among campaign donors compared to their share of the population. But where we look at public financing programs, things look different. And uh, there, are, there are nearly 40 different places in the country, states, cities, and counties that have some form of small donor public financing. And um, in many places, this is a policy that after the jurisdiction adopted it, you saw more women and people of color running for office and winning office. And for the reasons Anne was describing, that matters very much to the people at home. Um, uh, I don't want to go too long past time, but I'll point to a couple of exciting developments that folks may want to follow. Um, here in New York City, we just had a city council election for our municipal legislature, um, where we've had a version of multiple match small donor public financing for decades, but this was the first cycle with a higher match and lower contribution limits across the board. We have, for the first time, a city council that is representative demographically of the city in terms of gender and race. And really interesting to us, although we haven't examined it with like statistical significance the way Sheila and her crew might, we found that looking at the most viable candidates, there was a ranked choice. It was also the first cycle where ranked choice voting was in effect. So that's of course a factor, but looking just at the top performing candidates, the ones who were the top vote getters in the primaries, there was near parity in fundraising across race and gender in terms of amounts raised, reliance on small donor public financing, and this is not something that you see in, in elections without public financing. Um, if you look at congressional elections, at campaign fundraising, you find that women, and in particular women of color, rely more on small donations to raise their money. So even if they're raising as much money or more money than say a white male competitor, they're having to work harder. They're having to get more support for more people. So small donor public financing is a policy that sort of meets that phenomenon and amplifies it and is a, an option for candidates and their supporters who would even prefer to raise their support in that way, as opposed to just going to a few big donors to get a few big checks. Um, and I'll just end by previewing that New York State is about to launch its first small donor match public financing program. This November, legislative candidates for the 2024 cycle can begin opting in, filing papers to say, yes, I would like to run as a publicly financed candidate. This is a program that the Brennan Center worked for many years to help design, build up, worked alongside many grassroots organizations and allies to build the support for this program in a state that has been the subject of campaign finance scandals, huge donations from big industries that are very influential in New York City and New York State. Um, and until recent events, everyone's familiar with 
was known as the state where big policy got made by three men in a room. And we're very excited to see the program launch uh, and excited to report back, hopefully, in a couple of years about uh, the benefits to women and people of color and voters across the state. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Chisun and Sheila and Anne. I have a feeling that we could extend this conversation for an hour and still not cover all the really um, important um, challenges and opportunities that are um, that await us. So thanks so much for your expertise. And my apologies that um, that we are, are short on time, but it's, I think, a testament to the complexity of the challenges we face, that there's so much to cover in a relatively short period of time, and we want to hear from as many voices as we can. So um, I'm, I believe that this uh, conversation will continue as we transition into the panel um, segment where we'll have people who are working on the ground um, to uh, answer some, uh, to have a discussion on some of the best practices that are happening. So thanks very much for um, talk to Anne and Sheila and Chisun. And um, just really excited uh, for this next um, panel session with on the ground experts who are out there making things happen. Um, there'll be some time for audience, no, there won't be time for audience Q&A because we already have a lot of questions that have been submitted. Um, but uh, this panel discussion is going to be moderated by Anita Coward Mayers, my uh, dear friend whose name I might be mispronouncing right now. So I apologize if that's the case, but I think of you as my sister. Sisters don't have to pronounce names correctly. So you know, I hope you'll <laughs> give me a pass. Um, there. Uh, Anita is vice president of the Miram Group and the former director for New York City's Voter Assistance Commission at the Campaign Finance Board. We'll also hear from Sarah Blahovic, the disability civic engagement expert, Molly Fitzpatrick, who's the Boulder County clerk and recorder, and Michelle Whitaker, who's a messaging and campaign strategist, and uh, Teresa Mosqueda, who's a member of the Seattle City Council. So Anita, I will let you take it from here. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Well, hello, and happy International Women's Day. Uh, I'm so happy to be part of the Democracy Solutions Summit uh, by our fearless leader, Cynthia Terrell, and the team at Represent Women. We are the third panel of the day, which means we put the action into solutions. I'm happy to moderate today's session, uh, as you heard, with the following four action-focused women, Sarah Blahovic, the disability, disability civic engagement expert, Molly Fitzpatrick, Boulder County Clerk and Recorder, Michelle Whitaker, messaging and campaign strategist and a dear friend, and council member Teresa Mosqueda from the Seattle uh, City Council. In this conversation, we will learn more about their action solutions in the areas of early voting, vote by mail, universal voter registration, electronic voting access, redistricting, and better campaign finance. At this time, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and to talk a little bit about the work that they do. So I'm going to ask Michelle, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so glad to be here with you this afternoon. Um, and I share my wishes uh, for a happy International Women's Day. This is great to be together with all of you. Um, my name is Michelle Whitaker. I am a campaign um, strategist. Uh, I, I help um, both nonprofits, but also political campaigns on, on both messaging strategy, but also on the on the ground field work that they do. Um, I've also been an electoral reform advocate working on reforms like automatic voter registration, fair elections for campaigns, uh, vote by mail and helping to get vote by mail uh, voters uh, uh, applications so that they can participate in elections by mail. Um, and with all of those, I've actually had the opportunity in Maryland where I live to put almost all of those uh, reforms into practice, either through running campaigns or as a voter myself and being able to use those reforms. And so I'm really excited to share with you my experience, um, both on fair elections, but also to add um, on the other reforms as well that we'll be talking um, about this afternoon. So really glad to be here with all of you. Thank you, Sarah. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Blahovic. I am a I, I work in disability civic engagement. I work currently for the National Council on Independent Living as their voting and civic engagement director, um, although I'm just representing myself today. Um, and so my work really spans um, civic engagement for people with disabilities, um, both including what I'll be talking about today, obviously voting rights and access for people with disabilities, as well as political representation and elected office for people with disabilities. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Molly? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Molly Fitzpatrick. I'm the Boulder County Clerk and Recorder here in Colorado. First, thank you all for organizing this Solution Summit. And as Michelle said, happy International Women's Day. I, uh, my background, so I have a voter rights background. I started organizing and registering voters on my college campus when I was 18 years old. And then I eventually began uh, organizing regionally uh, for both engagement, registration, and turnout of young voters in Boulder County and then across Colorado. And it's really that work that helped me learn more about the experience that young voters have when they are trying to register to vote or to cast their ballot. And so I did that work for about a decade. And when our current clerk and recorder here in Boulder County was term limited, I decided to go ahead and run for office because I wanted to continue making our election process easier, not only for young voters, but all voters who have been historically excluded from our elections administration. And so um, right now I am continuing on with that work through legislation, through our communications and outreach, and also through our programming. And I'm excited to learn from the panelists today about what else we can be doing here in Boulder County to support even more voters. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Council member. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Teresa Mosqueda, Seattle City Council member. I got elected in 2017 and then just last November in 2021 got reelected. I have the honor of having the title as the first first time candidate to ever win using our publicly fin financed democracy vouchers. Uh, and that was in 2017. And now I have the honor of having the title of the first incumbent to win using democracy vouchers and have only gotten into office ever using publicly financed campaigns. Uh, before I came to Seattle City Council representing the over 750,000 people across our city in my at-large position, I worked for the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, for about seven years. I ran a program at the state level and in partnership with the national called Path to Power, encouraging folks to see themselves running for office, encouraging women and people of color, younger folks, union members, members of the LGBTQ community to see themselves in office. And doing so because I had spent the 10 years prior to that in advocacy for kiddo health care, health insurance for everyone, fighting for early learning, and just here hearing over and over, we'll get to that next year. We need more people with lived experience to get into office. And so um, being on the side of encouraging people to run for office so many times, and then actually doing it myself and seeing how some of that uh, encouragement gets translated, I am so excited to be here to talk about democracy vouchers, encouraging access to democracy, and really celebrating International Women's Day so that more folks uh, like us can get into office. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank all four of you. Uh, I want to try to get things warmed up here first for a little bit. So I have asked each panelist to think about what is a verb that they would use to describe themselves and or the work that they do. So I'll start. I will choose my action verb is service. Now, some may call that a noun, but I learned as a young child that when you present yourself to be of active service, you get farther with your goals. As they say, service is the rent we pay for our space here on earth. And I have tried to continue to be of service to all. And if I keep that in mind, you're serve, when you're serving, you're serving someone's needs, right? And you try to ident you try to listen to what those needs are and service those instead of always trying to feel that you know what people need, but service what they say their needs are. So I would choose service as my verb. Sarah, would you like to go next? 
Uh, sure. Um, so I think the word I would choose is support. Um, whenever it comes to talking about voting rights um, and uh, civic engagement in terms of running for office, it's really about supporting people to be leaders in their community, um, supporting people to have the information and the, the tools they need to be able to, to vote or to run for office or to you know, work on a campaign. Um, because you know one person or just a few people can't carry an entire community. You need to be able to support people with the information um, and, and the just, I guess it's kind of redundant, but the support they need, whatever supports they need uh, to be able to take action so that you can have more leaders. Um, and that means not always being the person at the forefront. It means uplifting others. It means making, being aware, self-aware of whenever your voice is needed or when someone else needs to be speaking up and centered. Awesome, thank you. Molly? Optimize is my motivating word. Um, we are very fortunate that in Colorado, voting is very easy and accessible. It's a great place to be a, a voter. Uh, our vision here in Boulder County elections is for Boulder County to be the best place to be a voter. And so when I looked up the word um, optimize to get the Google definition for everyone earlier, it says it's the act of making something as fully perfect, functional, or effective as possible. And so for us, that means the work never stops. We never settle it good enough. We keep pushing for those micro improvements and those micro efficiencies that make things better. Um, so it, sometimes that can feel like you're just attacking problems with you know, a very fine uh, lens, but it's the, those little efficiencies really do add up and make an impactful, positive experience, not only for the administration of our elections, but also for um, our voters as well. So optimize is the word that I uh, resonates most with me and is most motivating. Love it, love it. Teresa? Well, I'm, a, I'm gonna not follow directions very well here. I'm gonna <laughs> use the term that our office loves, which is aggressively collaborative. We are aggressively trying to pull people into decision-making tables and collaborative to the degree that we wanna make sure that things pass and that there's buy-in. And so I think that um, that might ring true as well for getting people to run for office. Like it takes women notably seven times to be asked to run for office before women get to a place where they will think about saying yes, not until we say yes, but until we think, oh, maybe that's a possibility I should look into. So we have to be aggressively collaborative, uh, both in getting folks into office and then once we're there, making sure that policy is defined um, through the lives of those who have lived experience. And that requires constantly being aggressively collaborative. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we do on International Women's Day, right? We change the rules, right? <laughs> Michelle? Yeah, my word is create. Uh, one, it's the name uh, within the name of my organization or the um, business that I run for, for consulting, uh, MCW Creative. That's what I want to do. But I uh, create space for others to have an opportunity to be part of the process in whatever that way. If we're talking about elections, how they can be more engaged and participate in those elections. I also create the opportunities for us to shift the way we're looking at um, problems to make sure that we're creating solutions that match what we need for communities. So it's not, you know, this is the way that things have to work. Oftentimes we have to be able to think outside of the box and find new ways that make more people part of the process, more people engaged, more people informed. And that requires creativity to make sure that you're not just talking to the same folks all the time. And that's what I love to do. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, you know, I don't know how many people have been following this new game out there called Wordle, <laughs> but it seems to me right now we have a SSO A and C. So maybe by the end of this panel, we'll come up with a word. <laughs> That will be our word of word for, for the panel. Uh, but until then, um, now I want to go back into some of our action items. And um, some of what we want to talk about is something, you know, that you have seen somewhere else that you brought to your constituency. The reason why we have these 
panels and we have conferences and we used to gather and all of those kinds of things, but it was because we wanted to learn from each other, right? So it was to help with, you know, being of service, you know, aggressively um, being collaborative, right? You know, finding those things out there that we felt could motivate our own communities and, um, and, and what might fit for ourselves. Now, sometimes not everything always fits at the time that we want them, but we bring those ideas back and we start to think about them. So I want to ask each of you a little bit about things that you've seen other places that you've actually been able to come back home and implement at home. I'm gonna ask Molly if she wants to start. Sure, there are a couple of things. The first thing that um, always comes to mind is our backend automatic voter registration system. Um, we weren't the first state in the country to do it. Uh, we were looking at, um, I believe Oregon is the first state um, who did a fully back out, back end voter registration, automatic voter registration system. So we were able to really learn a lot of their experiences with AVR and how we could implement it here in Colorado. And so now we are trying to, and I am trying to support other states as they look to implement automatic voter registration in their states, which is really the most, I believe, effective way to get someone to vote. Because you can do all the outreach that you want, but if you're not registered, you can't vote. And so I, voter registration is the most important aspect, I think, of um, election reform. So looking at same-day voter registration, online voter registration, automatic voter registration, really looking at all the different ways that people can get registered and making sure that we're making the reforms necessary to make it as easy as possible. Um, some of the programmatic things that we've done, uh, I, I think of two things. One is our high school program. We, we have always looked at how other jurisdictions do high school work across the country, and we've kind of uh, combined a lot of different things that we've seen, and we actually created a high school voter registration awareness week. And the reason that we did this is because we have voter pre-registration here in Colorado. So 16 year olds can get pre-registered to vote. Um, so when they turn 18, they're all ready and they get that ballot automatically in the mail. Um, and so one of the things that we did was work with our school districts here in Boulder County to have them adopt a resolution declaring that a certain week in April was high school voter registration awareness week. And that allowed us to really work with the administrators and they could wrap their hands around a specific week. We all know that uh, student, or, uh, teachers and administrators are already overwhelmed with responsibilities, but if they have one week, they can really wrap their hand or their arms around. That's a really positive thing. And then also for students, having the school boards adopt this resolution signaled to them that it mattered. And I think reaching students in high schools is one of the most important things that we can do because they are still surrounded by those uh, influencers that are really important in their life. And so that was one thing that we um, implemented that we kind of took a bunch of different ideas from other jurisdictions. And then the other thing that we did that I'll mention is our uh, Boulder County election security briefing report. And we produced that report in August of 2020. And it's a 20 page report that provides an overview and an in-depth overview of what we're doing here in Boulder County and in Colorado to demonstrate integ integrity, accuracy and accessibility of our elections. And that was something that Orange we saw um, Orange County do originally a couple of years ago. And so that was really, what inspired us to do something that spoke to voters here in Boulder County and in Colorado. And the timing could not have been more perfect for that report because it was in August, 2020 when all of the mis and disinformation started swirling around. So that was a great tool that we had in our toolkit to say, here's everything you need to know about election security in Colorado. So there's always so many great ideas and I always like the Cleary Awards uh, because you can, just steal other ideas from other jurisdictions, which I think is the whole point. So um, it's always a great uh, toolkit for us to pull from. Absolutely, and I would imagine that sometimes, like you said, you have all of the information, sometimes you have all that you need right there. So you have a lot of low hanging fruit and you see something, you're inspired, you know that you have a lot of the tools already in your kit to make it happen. Uh, whereas some of them may take a little longer. I know the first thing you were talking about was the back end voter registration. Um, I'm not sure how long it took to implement a program like that. 
Well, and we've done a couple of different versions of it. We had a front end automatic voter registration system where they were um, opting in. And then we moved a couple of years later to opt out. So it did take a couple of years and it was always easier to point to other states that have done it first to say it's been done here successfully. Um, and here are the challenges and here's how we would address those challenges. So it did take a couple of years and um, we went through a couple different versions of it until we got to the system that we have now, which I think is the most effective. Um, and there's some really exciting data that just came out about our system. And um, if you, I'm sure it's all, all over the internet. If you just Google automatic voter registration Colorado, it's um, we're really proud of how successful it's been and um, how many people it's been able, able to register. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, council member, what have you seen in other places that you've been able to bring back to um, your constituents and to your body? Well, in terms of um, getting more folks to participate in our democratic process and getting engaged in voting, Washington State has long been touted as a national leader on uh, vote by mail. All of our ballots um, come to registered voters at their home. And then we have about two weeks to fill out those ballots and get them turned in. But I think what we've noticed over time was that uh, we saw a lot of really great strategies in other jurisdictions that were allowing for same day registration, opportunities for folks to sign up um, in community and to to couple vote by mail with same day registration was a really powerful tool that our legislature uh, pulled together. So while since 2005, we've had vote by mail, it wasn't until 2018 that we had same day registration and then 2019 it went into effect, which is relatively recent. Um, but that's a great way to say, yes, we can still be national leaders and we also have to be learning and adapting policy all the time. The same is true here locally in Seattle. Uh, again, I'm really proud of our democracy vouchers, um, proud of the publicly financed campaigns that we have. And if folks don't know, these are literally paper vouchers that get mailed to every registered voter in Seattle. Um, and it's $100 four $25 coupons that you can send to any candidate that accepts democracy vouchers that commits to low dollar campaigns. And this was hailed as a huge accomplishment when it passed by voters in 2015. In 2017, I was part of the first cohort to win using democracy vouchers. But what happened in 2017 was we realized that those vouchers got mailed out the first week of January. And if you're a candidate who is a woman, a person of color, a younger person, a member of the LGBTQ community, folks who don't typically consider themselves running for office and need encouragement and support networks to get there. We saw a lot of candidates who weren't jumping right in. And so the candidates who traditionally get in, uh, older, male, whiter candidates, they were jumping in and able to start collecting democracy vouchers. So when I got elected, we changed that date so that democracy vouchers didn't get mailed out until March, which gave candidates not, you know, not um, fitting the old um, mold of what candidates look like and encouraging newer, younger, more diverse candidates to think and give them time to get into the race. That was a really helpful change. Another thing that we adapted came from a lot of the outreach that many jurisdictions and states have done successfully related to sit at, um, the census engagement, creating trust and building an understanding of the options that folks have and what, where your government is trying to work for you. We funded a lot of community-based organizations in language, in, in um bicultural, bilingual ways to make sure that folks know what the census is, right? We applied that same approach to understanding democracy vouchers because those democracy vouchers get mailed out and without context of this is money for you to use. If you felt like your voice didn't matter, here's an opportunity. Um, they needed to know that those democracy vouchers gave them power, power to elect people who would listen to them. And so one of the first things that we did when I got into office was change it so that small community-based organizations could do outreach in language in culturally competent ways so that they could educate folks about democracy vouchers being available. And I think that's been a powerful tool to make sure that people know how to use those vouchers and then they can help elect folks that look more like them and represent them. Awesome, I love all of that. Listen, listen to Washington optimizing <laughs> from Boulder. Michelle? Yeah, so um, I have, I'm fortunate that I work in coalition with a lot of groups at the national and state level. And so there's three kind of reforms that I think of that we've been able to bring to Maryland where, um, where I live um, that are based on things that we've seen in other parts of the country. First, vote by mail. 
Rockville um, was the first city to use vote by mail, all of all vote by mail election. Um, uh, they used it in 2019 for their um, mayoral and council elections. And as it was the first time using it, there was a lot of things that we needed to do to figure out, to make sure that we were doing outreach with all voters, the, the 40,000 or so voters that are in the city to make sure that they understood what the program was, that they you know, got, got their ballot, you know, were able to fill that out and return it um, and vote or drop it off at a, a drop box. And so, you know, there's a great learning process, but what happened was because uh, Rockville used it in 2019, when the pandemic hit and in the 2020 election, when the entire state needed to uh, adopt a new system, we actually had, could go to Rockville and talk to the clerks there and work with the clerks to understand how they implemented it for the entire city to make sure that we were putting in best practices in each county and across the state. And that's, you know, the work of election administrators, coalition partners in the state who are focused on election reform, really coming together to make sure that we could make sure everybody could participate safely in the election. And I've been able to use those skills to work nationally on vote by mail programs where we've been able to like send out applications and inform millions of voters across the state, again, during the pandemic, to like make sure that they understood how to vote, what to, you know, how to request their ballot and how to return it and make sure that they had their voice count. Secondly, when we talk about fair elections, um, fair elections programs in Maryland, we've had uh, it available for gubernatorial candidates, but it hasn't been used widely. Uh, and then Montgomery County, where, again, where I live, was the first county to adopt it for countywide elections. And I, it, the opportunity Opportunity to use it was like we had a flood of candidates use it for the first time, um, but fo folks weren't sure how to use it or how to make this really work to their advantage. And I'm glad that I had the opportunity to work with candidates who were really engaged in changing the dynamic, looking at new voters, voters that you don't typically go to, because you had to kind of flip the script if you're looking at low donor um, contributors, who is that? Who does that expand your universe of people that you can donate to because of the matching system that exists within the fair elections program? And I've been working with our coalition partners, a fair election coalition partners, to really help advocate for that across uh, the state where we have more jurisdictions who have adopted it recently and are onboarding to use it in either this election, uh, the 2022 election, or the 2024 election or beyond. And so that's kind of the um, exciting thing with fair elections. And then finally, I'll talk about ranked choice voting. Um, I'm a strong advocate for ranked choice voting. I'm on the board for Represent Women, and I've been uh, a uh, former staffer on fair vote. And uh, when I think of reforms like fair elections, when I think about increasing ballot access, I also think that we need to make sure that we are figuring out ways that our vote, the, our choices, where we have those choices when we go to the ballot, especially when we have multiple candidates running, and that we create systems that encourage women and people of color to run free of negative campaigns and in ways that shape them to, to find those coalition and ways that they um, can uh, relate to other candidates and voters who are looking at multiple candidates for a position. And we have Tacoma Park, which has been using ranked choice voting um, for a decade. And we are really doing the active work to expand that to other uh, jurisdictions, counties that need um, enabling legislation at the state level. But it's all kind of a process where we're trying to talk about like in, in the universe of electoral reform and expanding democracy. We can't, it's not just one solution is the one thing that makes sure everything works in democracy. We need to make sure that we're combining the things, fair elections with ranked choice voting, um, you know, doing redistricting reform and making sure we're changing uh, how, how we're doing that so we're ending gerrymandering. All of those things work together and it's, a, it's about us really thinking collectively about those reforms. And um, I think th those are our opportunities is really kind of expanding um, the, the suite of democracy reforms that we advocate at the local, state, and national level. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, so I'm coming from a little bit of a different perspective here as someone who is working within a national nonprofit organization um, where we work with a lot of um, uh, local organizations, centers for independent living around the country. Um, so just want to start by shouting out really some of the reforms that we um, have seen that we really are trying to promote as best practices. Um, so whenever it comes to things like vote by mail, vote by mail has been greatly beneficial to many people with disabilities, including myself, uh, who have difficulty with things like standing in long lines at the polls. 
Um, unfortunately, for one, uh, at least two subgroups of the disability community, uh, vote by mail is not accessible uh, by itself. So people who are blind and low vision voters, as well as people with certain physical disabilities may not be able to independently hand mark a paper ballot and return it. Um, and since, uh, so we have seen um, different places, uh, notably West Virginia is one of them, uh, where fully electronic um, systems for returning, uh, for, for um, cast, casting and returning and, and verifying a ballot um, have been implemented for overseas and military voters and then have also been now um, extended to voters with disabilities. Um, so we like to see things like that you know there's a longer much longer discussion we can get into there about the concerns from the security community um, about the security of those systems but seeing the um, systems that are offered to overseas and military voters also extended to voters with disabilities is uh, really critical and we're seeing that um, happen in other states and jurisdictions as well um, and then I would also say, you know, I, I really like I live in Alexandria, Virginia, right across uh, from from Washington, D.C. And I would say they are kind of my gold standard for um, whenever I see elections offices that really have a good rapport with the disability community. Um, prior to the election, they were really holding a lot. Of, they would hold regular um, forums for disabled and um, English as a second language voters to talk about some of the voting access issues, um, give them an opportunity to try out things like um, electro the, the accessible equipment in the polling places um, to, to get a familiarity with that and to really answer their questions about the voting process. And along with that, at least a couple years ago, whenever I spoke to them, at the door, their poll workers would ask if you wanted to vote on a paper ballot or vote on the electronic machine. And seeing something as simple as that is really critical because a lot of people, including a lot of voters with disabilities, may not know about the electronic machine. They may not know that they're allowed to use it. Um, and that poll workers are not allowed to restrict people based on who they believe to be, you know, quote unquote, disabled enough to use um, the electronic equipment. So that actually includes increase the, um, the use of that and also the fami familiarity of poll workers with that equipment, um, because oftentimes you'll see that poll workers may not have the training or may not have enough um, knowledge of how to use that machine to assist voters. Um, and then two other things I'd like to mention as uh, so the American Association of People with Disabilities several years ago created National Disability Voter Registration Week. It used to be in July around the ADA anniversary. And now it is in September, uh, around the time of many of the other civic holidays. So I think they really looked at that modeling off of those civic holidays that we see in September and October to particularly talk about voting access for people with disabilities. Um, the the vote, um, voter gap for people with disabilities is still at 6%. Um, so really trying to make sure people are informed, uh, are able to make a plan to vote, uh, to talk about voting access issues. Um, and then more from a programmatic perspective and talking about um, equal representation, um, there uh, prior to a few years ago was no information on running for office with a disability. Um, and that is something that I identified as we really needed to start filling in that knowledge. So I created the first campaign training program for people with disabilities. Um, it is available online um, and it all, all materials are, are screen reader accessible. Um, we as of 2021, we had both cart captioning, which is, you know, um, having an actual transcriptionist and ASL interpreting for all sessions. Um, and going also from a lens of intersectionality, the majority of our speakers are uh, people of color, uh, people with disabilities, um, Obviously, it was more of a challenge in 2019 to do that because just identifying people with disabilities in that space was so much more difficult. Um, and we're starting to see a lot more interest in, um, or, or not so much interest, but openness about running for office with a disability, um, some of the challenges and barriers that exist around that and, and what we can do to support candidates um, and to kind of erase some of the stigma around different disabilities in elected office. Thank you so much. You know, listening to each of you continues to inspire me. I know I had a title of former on there and sometimes it makes you feel like getting back in the game there, although you never really leave the game. You know, as, um, 
as a former director, you know, in New York City on voter assistance and a former agency head in voter assistance here in New York, we did a lot of work around uh, creating Voter Awareness Month, a video voter guide, Student Voter Registration Day, the Youth Poet Laureate uh, Poetry Program, our Voter Day in our state's capital, advocating for early voting and many of the policies that now exist. And I know that service happens over time and never alone. So the question I have for you is, what is one thing, because I'm listening here and still inspired and still learning more and still seeing what's still missing. Uh, what is that one thing that you would say is uh, something that you'd still like to implement uh, to make voting process easier and more efficient? And if you could add, like you can never do these things alone, who, who are likely partners that you would recommend people turn to? Molly, how about we try to start with you? Sure. Uh, so we're, again, we're very fortunate in Colorado that our system is so accessible for voters. Um, and again, for us, it's about optimizing and finding those micro improvements and micro efficiencies. So there's a, one thing that we do kind of perpetually, regardless of what's going on legislatively or what we're trying to enact from a big picture level. Um, but we are always looking at these, these letters what's on our website, we're basically always inventorying what the message is that we're putting out there. And could it be tweaked to be more easily understandable? Could we say it in a different way? Should we add a certain language? Should we translate this? Um, so we're always kind of looking at um, what we have a big inventory list of everything that's public facing. And we always are just revisiting it to see, could we say something differently? Could we say it more inclusively? Is it time to update this? Um, so I would say that's number one, that's kind of a perpetual thing that we do here in Boulder County elections, because again, the difference between asking a question this way and asking a question another way can be the difference in someone voting or not. And so again, those micro improvements to language is really, really important and something that we take incredibly seriously. Um, but one thing that we're really excited to implement this year is our um, minority language program. So we passed a bill last year at the state legislature that requires counties of a certain size to or uh, certain size with minority language um, demographics to uh, create ballots for voters in those languages. So now if you're a voter who speaks a minority language, um, you can come into a vote center and request a ballot in your language. And this is something that I personally care very deeply about. I have seen it firsthand when I was in my previous role working to ensure people had what they needed to participate in the process. You know, they would go to vote in person and then they were challenged because there was no one that either spoke their language or they couldn't get a ballot in their language. And so we did advocate for this update to Colorado elections. And this year is the first year that we're going to have that. So certain counties are going to be required to produce a ballot in, um, in our county at Spanish. So one thing in terms of partnerships, uh, we are working with or, and are going to work with the nonprofits here in Boulder County that serve voters who speak Spanish primarily as their language um, to make sure that they are aware of this offering because it is new and we wanna make sure that we are coordinating with our nonprofit leaders here in Boulder County to ensure that they can help us in spreading the word. And we'll also do all of our um, traditional outreach and then again, inventorying what are we saying on radio, on our website and our newsletters and postcards and um, voter notices. And we're gonna ensure that this is always included again, because it's new. We have to look at these things every single time you send something out or put something on the website because so much has changed. And this is a really important change that I think makes our elections even more inclusive. So that's one thing that we're um, excited to implement this year. Great, thank you. Council member? I love this question because uh, there's a lot that we can celebrate and then we also have to be thinking about what's next. So the three questions that I ask of us in, uh, in Seattle about the democracy voucher programs is, does it change who runs for office? Does it change who donates and stays engaged? And then does it change the dynamics? So on the first question, does it do democracy vouchers, the vouchers actually being mailed to people's homes and you as residents being able to choose who you give this money to, publicly financed dollars, 
it absolutely can change who stands up and runs for office. When I ran in 2017, there were eight people, which was a large number compared to previous years, eight people who stood up to run for office that year. Of us eight, there was only one straight white man. Everyone else were people of color, women, younger folks, members of the disability community as well, and folks who had not historically potentially seen themselves as viable candidates knew that they didn't have to self-finance their campaigns or sit in a dark windowless room dialing for dollars to people they may have never met before just because they have a bigger pocketbook than they do. It allowed for people to see themselves running for office and it definitely diversified who ran in 2017, 2019, and arguably last year as well. The second question is, does it change who voted and how people engaged in elections. It absolutely did. I remember knocking on doors pre-COVID in 2017 and folks would answer their door and they'd look at the flyer and they'd look at me and I'd tell them I was running for office and why I was there and I was a democracy voucher candidate. And they'd say, no one has ever come to my door before. No one has asked for my vote or for my opinion before. I am interested in what you have to say and I'm thrilled that you're running. And they would quite literally hand over democracy vouchers in that moment at the door and I could walk away from a, a day of doorbelling with 500, 600, 700 democracy voucher dollars in my pocket. But more importantly, I was talking to community and hearing what they wanted to see from an elected at the local level. And it changed who donated. In 2015, when the campaign um, to pass honest elections was on the ballot, there was only eight thousand people who donated that year. Flash forward to 2017 when democracy vouchers were available, 25,000 people donated in that election using democracy vouchers. That increased the donations by threefold and it changed who was donating too. There's a map we're going to put on our social media right now that shows the north and the south and communities of color, renter neighborhoods, folks who are working families, they were donating and you can compare that to the mayoral election which was also citywide, not taking democracy vouchers at that time and it is a very different picture of who donated and then not only donated but I hope and uh, the data proves stayed engaged and actually followed through on voting. So if the answer is who donated and did we change what the engagement look like for voters? Absolutely. But the final question, and to your kind of um, point to all of us, what else needs to be done? If the final question is, does it get money out of politics? Then I think that's where we collectively have a huge opportunity to organize and mobilize for campaign finance reform at the state, at the, at the local, and at the national level, because these corporations should not be treated as people, and we are never going to be able to out fundraise the deep pocketed um, corporate backed candidates, we can out organize them. And that's what I think we did in our in our campaign. But we have to get money out of politics. Because ultimately, those democracy vouchers are a great antidote right now to fight against the anti voter, anti um, civil rights uh, role that we all have as voters and folks who want to get people actively engaged in our democracies. But to fight these bohemists and these deep pocketed um, campaigns, it's going to take campaign finance reform at the national level and I look forward to working with all of you on that. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> uh, wow, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking we're gonna break the rules a little bit because I think it's really hard to say one reform. <laughs> and so, so I know like, I want, I want to say, but I think it speaks to what I was talking about earlier. There, there are multiple reforms that are needed and based on the circumstances in different jurisdictions and different communities, we need to be focusing on different things. There are some communities where we need to be focusing more on, auto, uh, on voter registration because those communities lack access to like getting the information and being registered so that they can fully participate. In other communities, it might be more of that access piece, whether it's the disability access or other pieces. Um, for others, it might be, how do I make sure my voice is heard? And so they want ranked choice voting, or they want to make sure that the people who are being elected aren't um, being beholden to corporations, but to people, you and me, and they want more fair elections. So I, I'm going to say like, all of those are very important. And so we need to be, we need folks who are advancing those and looking at what is needed specifically for different communities and what we can scale up to be more of our statewide a statewide reform, um, a, a, a jurisdiction-wide reform, and, and a national reform when that, where that is. There are great partners who are working on this, including Represent Women, who has been helping to 
to the, the gender parity and ranked choice voting and other fair, um, fair representation reforms. Um, I work closely with uh, Common Cause, particularly Common Cause Maryland here um, on these reforms along with the League of Women Voters. Those are some great groups. There's lots of other ones who are focused either on you know, ballot access pieces, vote by mail, and we need to like find out who is doing the work, find out who's working on the ground get connected to them, support the work that they're doing so that they can do more of that, that we're funding those groups, we're funding people who are who are on the ground and know what's happening. And I think to what uh, Council Member Teresa was saying in terms of answering those questions about like, how is this working better? We need to do more to evaluate our elections to see, is it actually being effective and working for voters and for our community? And we rarely do this. I don't think that there's, you know, we do canvases, the boards of elections do canvases after the election just to verify the vote and that process, but we don't necessarily go back to residents, to voters and say, how was that election? What were things that we could improve in the election? What's not working? What's What was working really well that you want to see more of? If we are not doing that feedback piece to understand what our elections is, then we maintain the status quo. And the status quo only works for those people who are already in power and things are working perfectly for them. And if we want to change the system, if we want more women elected, if we want more people of color elected, if we want to see different folks, different ideas, different voices, we have to be asking those questions and then making changes at the, the local, state, and national level to see that actually happen. So that's my that's my pitch there. <laughs> we got a lot of work still. Now, Sarah, <laughs> if you can round us out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'm going to break the rules here a little bit as well. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Uh, but I, I can think of, of three particular things, too, in terms of voting rights and, and one more in terms of the civic engagement and running for office aspect. So starting with voting rights, seeing the EAC funded to and resourced to address systemic accessibility issues. Accessibility is uh, the access barriers are on voter registration, voter education materials, including sample ballots and information on election, um, you know, office websites about accessibility at the polls, as well as the ones at the polling place or in the vote by mail process. Um, we've seen legislation that was was um, introduced. I, I think it was maybe last Congress. Senator Casey had the access Voting Act, which would have um, really funded the EAC to create a, um, you know, to track election, state election website accessibility, to provide resources to election officials on making their information accessible, to create a poll worker training clearinghouse, because a lot of the barriers come from uh, poll workers not really um, knowing how to uh, work with people with disabilities. Um, so seeing that um, instead of having this piecemeal approach where we have one um, election office that's really great at these things and then another one who isn't because they're just not familiar with this information, we need that top-down approach to be able to provide the time and resources to address those access barriers. A second one I'll say is as we talk about voting legislation like we've recently seen, um, such as the Freedom to Vote Act, making sure that there is a carve out in that uh, for the paper ballot mandates for people with disabilities to still be able to uh, access electronic voting, uh, remote voting systems that allow them to return their ballot electronically. Um, I don't know about you, but having someone else having to return my ballot for me does not feel secure. Um, and so people with disabilities should not be told, you know, there's nothing we can do about this. We're going to get rid of those systems, making sure that people, particularly print disabled voters, are still able to access those systems systems that are being put in place like in places like West Virginia is really important. Um, and then from the civic, the, the running for office perspective, I would really like to see um, currently uh, if you are receiving social security benefits, you cannot safely run for any level of elected office, including, you know, the smallest school board position without risking losing those benefits. With the way that our systems are set up in this country, many people with, with disabilities uh, who are able to uh, to run for office, which is different from a um, from a job or because they need these Medicaid and social security benefits, they need to be able to stay on these programs, they're not able to marry, they're not able to run for office uh, without losing um, 
losing access to those benefits. So seeing those rules amended within um, the Social Security Administration, where it is not seen as substantial gainful activity to run for elected office is something I would really like to see. Bravo, bravo. Well, thank you to everyone. This has been a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed spending this time, this last hour with each of you. Um, I know we put in there about our word of word and I have our COAS and our team that we did together. So I think we have coast. We work together from coast to coast. So that'll be our wordle for the day. Thank you all again. Amazing, amazing women on this International Women's Day. Uh, I guess it's back to you, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Anita and Michelle and Sarah and Molly and Teresa. Really, you're all doing amazing work and you're all incredible. So thanks so much. We're honored that you could uh, spend time with us at our Democracy Solutions Summit and on International Women's Day. And it's not just a day, we have a whole month this year too. So, you know, maybe next year we'll, we'll have two months and two days internationally. We'll have to start doing the numbers anyway. So I, I hope you're all feeling really encouraged and inspired by what was shared with us today. Uh, please visit our website, representwomen.org for more information on everything discussed here, including a lot of the take action resources that were mentioned by the panelists and next steps for how you can be part of the solution. Thanks so much again for, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you here tomorrow for day two of our Democracy Solution Summit, which is focused on fair access, the electoral college, voting rights, and the legacy of Lonnie Guineer. And again, happy International Women's Day. I hope you'll join me in a virtual round of applause for all the women in the United States and around the globe who are working to strengthen democracy. And as I like to say on my social media posts, teamwork makes the dream work. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.